Hello everybody, I am Ben from Team Panic and today we're going to be looking at the damage that Very Very Obvious took at Australian Nationals. Now we're going to basically going to do this because I realised that this is the first time Very 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 Obvious has taken any significant level of damage and I didn't really mention all that much in my fight recaps. I was talking a lot about the damage I dished out but I didn't really talk about uh, the damage that I actually took and the damage that I actually took is what is going to, uh, yeah, fuel the upgrades that we are going to do to Very Very Obvious. Because at the end of that video, I asked you guys out there if you wanted to see a new version of Very Very Obvious, or if you wanted to see me build something new and crazy. And overwhelmingly, you guys wanted to see Very Very Obvious upgraded, so we're going to do that. And today, we're going to talk a little bit about the damage, then we're going to talk a little bit about the upgrades that I want to do based on the damage that you're about to see uh, in here. So, to get all of this stuff started, I need to bring you in here. Okay, so we're going to kind of do this in fight order. Now, I could kind of just talk about all of the scratches and nicks that are visible right now, but I do want to do this in a little bit of fight order, just so that it makes some semblance of sense in this video. Uh, and to do that, we actually need to start with the back. So if I hike this guy around, just like this, uh, you can see along the back wall here, there's a bunch of chunks taken out of this HDPE panel. This is done by Rumblebee, our very first fight. So all of this yellow you can see along the back here is all Rumblebee. This peel out through the middle is not Rumblebee. That is a horizontal spinner that we'll talk about later on. Uh, but this is all Rumblebee and this actually worked really, really well because in underneath here, there is only a three mil piece of uh, hardened steel and it is Swiss cheesed. And there is so many gaps and holes in underneath this HDPE outer wall. Uh, just as a weight saving measure, that wall needed to be there, but I knew I was going to do this. And also this guy is actually rubber wobbed in place. There is a little rubber grommet in between the HDP and the wall. So I can't really flex this too much by hand, but it does give a little bit of flex when hit really hard. Now, this I'm going to keep doing because this worked really, really well. All of these chunks taken out of the back here are chunks and points where he didn't get enough bite on me to do any real damage. Eventually he did manage to get a good bite and throw me over, but each of these little catches, especially these ones you can see where the entire piece of plastic has been removed entirely, uh, that is perfect because that means that all of that energy went into ripping the plastic and very little got transferred into the body of the robot. I think it's this rip in the bottom corner over here where he actually finally grabbed hold of me and threw me over because I can actually lift the robot on one finger off of that chunk of plastic that is semi-ripped at the moment. So I think that's actually the hit that got us flipped over upside down. Um, yeah, so speaking of being upside down, if we then hike the robot round, again and face the front a little bit. There is this gash along the top here, which is into some Lexan. Once again, being a plastic material, even though it is Lexan, uh, he's just kind of ground along the top of that, which is really good. Uh, Cause once again, it's a lot of energy that didn't go straight into the robot. Instead, it just kind of ground off a little bit of plastic, which I could have replaced, but I didn't have a spare piece. And you know, at the end of the day, it wasn't all that critical on there. And then finally, round at the front here, we have a little bit more damage. That's this scuff mark across here. And actually maybe a little piece of, a little chipped piece of uh, HDP on the side here. But these, this scuff mark along the front and that scuff mark there, all caused by being upside down and being chunked at with the weapon. Oh, and then of course, I have to talk about the weapon pulley. So all of these big vertical gashes you can see in the weapon pulley, so all of these along here, this one along here, and I think it's actually two in here because you can kind of see there's one that kind of goes that way and then there's one that goes a bit this way and there's a separating line between them. So I believe this is actually two chunks out of this pulley, which is quite cool. And all of these are caused by being upside down 
and riding around on the bolt head. Uh, this big chunk up here is not from that. This big chunk is from something else we'll talk about in a little bit. Yeah, so I think that is that fight. There wasn't really any damage in the pothead fight. Then we did the Rumblebee fight and took all of that damage. And of course, lost that fight. And then went straight on through into the Stormfront fight, which was the big vertical spinner. So from that fight, there was a lot of damage to the tooth of the weapon, which I can get this back in frame somewhere. Uh, it's actually on the leading edge. So let's scoot you back somewhere. There's a bit of damage down there on the front of that weapon, but I mean, it is a little bit hard to tell with this weapon in particular because uh, it's taking damage and giving damage all at the same time. So that is a little bit difficult to tell which damage is from what and from what weapon. But the big one and the one I really, really should have talked about in the fight um, is actually not on this side. No, it is on that side. Check this out. There is a massive hole in here. This hole is just very, very scary. That is one of the, like almost perfect shot against me in this fight. So that is a direct hit from them and their weapon. It has annihilated the HDP. It's gone straight through the outer armor in and hit the hardened steel. It's taken a massive chunk out of the hardened steel right on my world points. It's also completely annihilated a bolt that was holding everything in place here. And it was bare millimeters from the wheel. Now, if they had contacted this shot further over, this would have been a very, very different fight because they would probably would have taken the wheel out or maybe would have taken the wheel out. I really don't know. At the very least, Having this shot hit the wheel, there is more open air to grab onto. These things are kind of flexible, so they may not have ripped, and instead it may have thrown the whole robot upside down. And uh, yeah, as we've seen in the past, us and upside down is really, really not good. Uh, we tend to uh, be in a bad state if we are upside down for too long. Now the other one is one of these wheels got hit by Rumblebee and had the, um, the tire ripped off and there wasn't too much actual external damage to these. There was just a little gash in one of them and I can't actually find it right now. Maybe if I find it, I will uh, put an image on screen here, but there really wasn't that much and it's really hard to see. So maybe even if I do find it, I probably won't actually put it up because there's not much to talk about there. Yeah, so that was that fight. And then we had our final fight that we took damage in, which was against Bender 3. And this is finally when we get to the, uh, the damage up the front here, the really scary stuff. This guy right here, um, it is absolutely insane. So Bender 3 is a horizontal spinner that was coming at us this way. And as far as I can tell from the footage, we hit weapon to weapon. They glanced up the weapon and straight up in to the actual nut up here. And in actual fact, this shot might actually be from Bender 3. I'm not really all that sure. There is a little bit of red up in here, just next to my finger, which is definitely from Bender 3. So one of these, like this may have been part of the hit that knocked out the top of the nut. I was very, very lucky. This has cracked the nut up here but the nylock still held and the nut still held and I could still actually take the thing off and put it back on again to transport the robot home. Um, yeah, so that was exceptionally lucky. Uh, I also did get a couple of gashes on the front. I think one of these at least is from Bender 3, but as you can see, this is six mil hardened steel, like six mil hard ox, so that was totally fine. That was never gonna go anywhere. Uh, there is no real damage on this side because the weapon was spinning and hitting this side of the robot. So if we drag this guy back around again, just like this, you can see there's two nice big holes. So one right here where they've got in and grip there and then one down the front here as well. Uh, so I was really, really happy after this fight that I had put this side armor on because originally I'd run this robot twice 
and I had had the side armor on and the side armor never got hit because of course the big spinning weapon usually protects this side armor. Uh, but up against somebody with a lot of reach like that, they can get lucky, get in under the weapon and slam into the sides. So this is only six mil thick HDPE and the weapon has gone pretty much all the way through it, uh, but hasn't seemed to really damage the actual chassis inside. Uh, so that was a good thing, I guess. But this armor probably needs to be upgraded and thickened um, going into a version two. So I've got the robot opened up. This is the base plate in under here that has been removed. And we're in here to talk about the final fight because there's only one piece of damage that happened in the final fight and it was self-inflicted. This is the weapon motor and there is a nice gap in this weapon motor now, which is really not supposed to be there, which means that this weapon motor is actually running, um, yeah, weaker than it really should be. And you can also see, if you just look around the outside edge there, there is a bunch of marks and scrapes up in here, which is another thing that we're gonna have to fix. So the reason I think that this motor is so bad is because it's literally just bolted straight into the hard ox uh, frame. And it's just basically a hard ox bucket that the motor mounts straight onto the actual frame itself. There is no shock mounting, there is no nothing, it's just hard, straight mounted into there. And yeah, that's really not a good idea. The best idea would be to shock mount this motor into very, very obvious's frame because that would actually allow the thing to bounce and wiggle a little bit when it's hitting things and it would not force all of this, the force of each hit through the shaft and through the crumb screws holding the motor together and stuff because obviously they aren't strong enough to take that. Um, the other thing too is that in here, so you can kind of see some of the triangles down here that I was talking about where the back plate is Swiss cheesed. And you can also see that there is a six mil thick piece of steel sitting in underneath the motors, which is actually extra ballast. This is about 600 grams of extra ballast and we're still underweight. So the whole chassis could get heavier or we could add extra features to the robot by removing this plate entirely, which is something I wanna talk about a little bit. The other thing you can notice in here is that it is a mess. There is just wires going absolutely everywhere and that is actually where all of these rub marks came from. These wires came loose in fights and were rubbing up against the weapon motor. And that's because there is nowhere in here to bolt in any kind of uh, shield or protection for that motor. And there is also nowhere to really bolt anything. So everything just kind of gets Velcroed in where it will fit. And even this uh, VESC up here is getting Velcroed in place. So I think it's time to talk about some upgrades. So the first upgrade obviously is to shock mount the weapon motor itself. So rather than have the holes directly in here, we'll have a space for a plate. The motor will get mounted to the plate and the plate will be shock mounted in up against the top here so that it will still be able to drive the weapon around at the top, um, but at the same time, it will have a small amount of shock mounting to it. That will be a lot better. I'm gonna remove our extra weight plate and we're also going to remove the brushed drive. So right now, very, very obvious is running on the drill drive system. And I mean, it works, but I've had it strip out at two different events now and I can't be having that. I can't keep having the drive strip out. So we're going to do a different system, probably a a uh, really big brushless motor, like a longboard brushless motor, two longboard brushless motors, one on each side with a straight set of gearing directly onto the wheels. I think that's gonna be the best way to go. Maybe a one to three, one to five. It's gonna save a little bit of weight. It's gonna be able to uh, compact stuff down so that we can fit the thing in the back here that I want all this weight for, which is a self-writing mechanism. Now, I have had a bunch of different uh, attempts at trying to work out where a self-writing mechanism makes sense on this robot, and I think it's out the back. I think it is actually between the back plate and the back armor here, so that's where we're gonna put something. It's gonna rest on the top and it's gonna leave it out that way, so kind of push to the side and flip the whole robot. So if this is the robot sitting here, it's gonna flip the robot that way, that type of thing. 
Uh, so that's gonna go out the back here and that's where this extra weight is gonna go. We're gonna put another brushless motor and a big gearbox and a lever arm and a whole bunch of stuff in here to try and get a self writing, mecha writing mechanism going because this bot could be quite lethal up until the point it goes upside down because the second it goes upside down, it's like just a plaything, basically. <laughs> it's a plaything for its opponent because I can't do anything at that point. I have no way to fight back. Uh, and that is what we need to fix. We need to have a way to fight back. Uh, and that way, of course, will be to self write So there's gonna be, I think, some small scale model testing that I'll do with this. I might build a 3D printed, uh, like maybe ant, maybe beetle weight chassis that's just weighted correctly at scale and see where I can get the self writing mechanism working, but I think it's gonna be out the back here. So that's why these drills need to go because these drills are basically half the chassis all the way across to about where my thumb is on both sides. So there's no space in the back here and also they weigh a lot and I've got that extra mounting plate there. So yeah, there's a bunch of stuff in the back here that we can do that will fix all of that. The other thing of course is I'm going to change the internals here and we're gonna have an internal structure so that things get held in place better and aren't just being, you know, using Velcro to hold all of the bits down because, yeah. I mean, it works kind of, but in heavy hitting fights, things come loose and uh, yeah, you end up with stuff like this where you just get wires dragging along motors and that type of stuff. So that's really not good and it's definitely something that I want to avoid in the next version. Yeah, okay, well, I, that I think is gonna be the end of this video. I've kind of gone over the damage, I've gone over what I wanna do with it. It's probably going to be kind of mid next year that we start looking at this guy again, but it will be a brand new rebuild from the ground up. I will recut all of the, uh, the hard ox parts and go again, although I may keep the weapons because at the moment, there's nothing really wrong with them. They need a bit of a balance, but other than that, they should be okay uh, to keep fighting. So yeah, there you go. Hope you guys have enjoyed that one and I will see you in the next video.